Welcome everyone to our Friday morning Arizona Bioscience Week event, Voice of the Patient. So for the last five days, we have been having the scientists and the doctors and the researchers and the innovators telling us what they do for patients. Today is extremely important because now the patients are going to talk to us about their experience and what they need. So I, first of all, want to thank all of our patient speakers who are with us today. It's really important, and we are so grateful for everything that you do. And for the members of the audience, the people that will be watching this online, um, thank you for listening to the patient's voices. We're a team, and as you can see up there, and the mysterious sunglasses, it does make them only mysterious and sexy, but aside from that, I just want to say to everybody sitting here, this is wonderful. Joan, you're going to have to make this part of the regular session because we have a lot of people to educate, and I think it has to be collaborating and doing it together. So God bless all of you for sharing this. And you're all heroes. I'm going to turn it over to my hero husband, Jack Cavanaugh. That's my uh, Joe Biden impression, by the way, in the, my photograph. Um, I'm the patient here, and uh, I have multiple my myeloma. 31 years ago, Barbara and I were about to get married in Boston. And I went for it. I was being transferred overseas. All my uh, working career was largely spent overseas in many different countries. And I was getting ready to go overseas again, and the uh, physical was required uh, by the, my employer to do that. I went to a GP, and he said, uh, with the results, uh, he said, eh, there's some protein there I want to have a doctor look at. And he said, uh, um, he gave me the name of a doctor, and he said he's an oncologist, which was really frightening. And uh, anyway, ultimately, I went to the oncologist, and he uh, sent me to a specialist at uh, Dana-Farber in Boston, and I was identified as having multiple myeloma. Uh, the specialist happened to be one of the best, uh, most re revered myeloma specialists in, in the world, actually, uh, Ken Anderson at, at Dana-Farber. Anyway, uh, I told Barbara, I said, well, I guess we can't get married then because, uh, you know, you don't want to marry me with, with this. And I said, you're not getting away with that. <laughs> so anyway, here we are. Um, so for the next 12 years, we traveled overseas um, on many different countries or several different countries and back to the U.S. and then back. Uh, we were in Holland and came back to Wisconsin and to Turkey, to Ireland, to England. Uh, and eventually uh, back in Phoenix when I retired. The, uh, so there were some unique uh, issues in dealing with uh, trans traveling like that. Um, one was the network of doctors, which was very important because uh, Dr. Anderson, for instance, uh, referred me to a specialist in Holland. Um, and I was smoldering uh, with myeloma at the time, which means that they don't treat you. Uh, when I was in Holland, uh, we were out one night and I sneezed and I broke a rib. And so the uh, specialist that they had recommended, uh, Dr. S uh, Anderson had recommended, uh, said, okay, I think it's about time to start some treatment because my myeloma weakens the bones. Um, so anyway, uh, I had chemo and it worked. And then I went on a maintenance of uh, interferon for the Every day I would uh, shoot myself with um, interferon, and that went on for many, <coughs> many years. And I had a relapse when we were living in London. Again, a little net through a network of doctors, I was able to re get referred to a uh, myeloma specialist. And uh, then we moved back here, and I'm now in the Mayo system. Um, and and so a number of things happen as your uh, as your as my career was going on and I was dealing with this disease. One of the things that uh, I did not want to have happen, and this is probably common today, but maybe not as common as it was 
when I was uh, in my working career, and that is the confidentiality. I did not want my employer to know that I had cancer, uh, which put kind of restrictions on uh, Barbara because wives talk about what their husbands are doing and whether they're ill or not ill, et cetera. Fortunately, I was able to work uh, no, no really no time off. But that was an important aspect um, of the way we lived our lives. Um, not in secrecy, but just being careful. Um, some of the things that, uh, as a patient, and Barbara's a caregiver, uh, which you'll talk about in a moment, um, that I think are important in the medical system. Um, I really had not experienced um, Mayo, the Mayo system until I had uh, been uh, diagnosed uh, with, uh, with my, myeloma. And uh, I first started using them when we were living in Wisconsin and went over to uh, Rochester. That system, I, th I think, is the gold standard. And I have been associated with other systems before that. And my sister lived in Florida and it was uh, recently died. And it was extraordinarily difficult for me in her final years to take care of her because she was going to different uh, doctors and getting records transferred and so on. Uh, so. Uh, it's a system, uh, many organizations now have portals. Uh, they have a portal, it's so easy uh, to put your request in. You get contact with your doctor or PA. And um, it's, uh, I, I think for young uh, people going into different systems, they should, they should look at that as a standard. Um, I think it's important for young students now, especially to maintain contacts after they get out of school because uh, through conventions or just uh, emails uh, through, to your fellow students, because you never know when you're gonna have a patient come in and uh, they're gonna be moving to an area or they, they, you identify them with a particular disease uh, that needs uh, a specialist uh, in that area. And those contacts within your profession, I think, are important. Uh, a caretaker is extraordinarily important, um, caregiver, sorry. Uh, if you can at all in your family pick someone that you know is capable of doing it and saying, look, I want you to be my caretaker, uh, it, assuming that uh, that person is reliable and would agree to do that because it's, it's uh, very difficult, especially with a, a serious disease like cancer where when you go to uh, even a routine in the meeting with your doctor, it's going to be, uh, uh, new. it may well be news that you have emotionally, it's very difficult to absorb at that time. Um, I, uh, Francine spoke about, uh, Francine is, she's here or not here, but anyway, Francine spoke about exercise. That's something I do as a patient, uh, and I really, really get a lot out of it uh, mentally, uh, for sure. And I think uh, uh, doctors uh, should always uh, try to find out what the lifestyle of their patient is and encourage them to do exercise. And Francine mentioned sleep, which is becoming more and more important. Uh, we're right, uh, research is recognizing how important that is in, uh, in your lifestyle. Um, doctors should be open. They should not get upset when uh, someone says, I wanted to get a second opinion. Uh, we, I can't tell you, Barbara can t can't tell you how many people through our contacts in the multiple myeloma community that have called her and said, okay, what do I do now? And for, the first thing is, have you had a second opinion? Um, or a or, third opinion or, have, or a fourth opinion. Or have you gone to a, a particular specialist in your field? Uh, so doctors, uh, even though they, it's difficult sometimes now with the system uh, to, for doctors to say, well, if I do that, they're going to leave my, my practice and I'm going to have to find, you know, the, the, there's a uh, cost factor there. But it's very, very important for the patient to get that second opinion and particularly with a specialist if you have anything that's uh, really, really serious. Um, I think I'll... Uh, I'll turn it over to Barbara now, who can talk about what um, what we've done or what she has done. She's been the driver of this uh, to uh, help the patient in the field of multiple myeloma. And now in all cancers, we have a program, a virtual program, that will be coming out early next year for all cancer caregivers. I'm really 
proud to be here. I'm proud because he's sitting here, and every day, as you know, is a challenge. And the reason I feel so emotional about it is when I hear each of your stories, it's one that I've lived, and because of that, when uh, we were overseas, as he said, I had to keep it a secret, and that was very difficult. But I did something because I'm a social worker, and I'm always trying to fix things, and people and systems, but what I did was I always volunteered, and by the way, the American Women's Club is the best volunteer group in the world, and what we did, we always worked, it was my suggestion, I let it, um, was that we would work with children with cancer, and I learned an awful lot. It didn't matter the age, the size, the religion, the, the um, language, that when you're working with the family, and you're helping children, then you can really make a difference. But I found when we came back from overseas, we were very lucky because I met Dr. Rafael Fonseca and Dr. Jeff Trent, and they asked me if I would do a seminar to educate other patients with myeloma because I had a background in education and social work, and I'm an advocate, and I'm a PIA. You know what that stands for. And so I said, yes, I'd be happy to do it, but I don't know anything about myeloma. To your own experience, most of the time, when you get some of these diseases, as you were saying, we are not a disease. We're individuals. But the fact of the matter, if we don't even understand what what our you know what what we have or what we're dealing with, um, then it's even harder to try and cope with it or live with it, and and that really became my theme. We called it living with myeloma, and we started doing conferences and started out with 30 people in 2004. I had to become a nonprofit, and let me warn anybody: don't become a nonprofit. But anyway, what I'm saying is it's complicated. But more important is that what we found in bringing people together and bringing the doctors to the people, and then they would be talking directly to people, um, that it was mutually beneficial. And it was wonderful, and it began to grow. But we also found that um, we would have different uh, specialists. We ha also had nurses and social workers speaking and other people who were, you know, in the general cancer field, which, by the way, cancer is a major industry, and that in itself is a whole another system we navigate. But what's important is our vision and our mission from day one was awareness, education, and advocacy. And then I added another you know, mission statement, which is collaboration. We have to work together. We have to talk to one another. And I know it used to aggravate, and it still does. Um, Jack has lost all privacy because I tell everybody. Um, you know, and he, and what I found was when he would stand up at our conference and say, I'm Jack Kavanaugh, I'm the patient, she's my boss, and then what he would say is, you know, it started out when we first came back. I've been, you know, I'm a survivor of cancer, you know, 13 years. Well, now he stand, when he stands up and says, I'm a survivor for 31 years. And you know what? We all have to take a role in it. It's not only the patient. It's the caregiver or caregivers, the family. It's also the physicians and also I learned through Jeff Trent about clinical trials. And so we started educating patients about clinical trials. Because who knew you could ask it to be in a clinical trial? You know, who knew there were so many clinical trials? So all of that is about educating ourselves to be there. And it's so good, and I know for all of you, when you're fortunate enough to have a family member or dear friend go with you to every appointment. I, I think I missed one appointment of probably, I'm happy to say, a thousand because he has gone and we do a lot of what we call uh, preventive by going more often. They say, well, you know, Jack, you're really not on any medication. You're very stable. Well, we go every three months. We go for a full review, you know, top to bottom. And other things have developed over the years, and we've been able to address them because we knew to ask. And don't let anyone tell you what you should 
do without also letting you know what the options are, but also what the side effects are. And, and again, being able to make that choice with information and resources. One of the other areas that we became involved in was part of our mission is reaching out to the underserved. Now, we, you hear a lot about that, but the accessibility is not necessarily because of someone's religion or race. It's often distance. It's often the lack of facilities that aren't everywhere and people not knowing about them. So we were up in the Navajo Nation. We did awareness up there. They were very afraid of the word research because, as you know, there have been some very negative experiences. Well, we brought up some real live researchers who were really, as you know, many of you are, really nice people. And so, again, you know, the, the taboos, the fears. And what I can say is for every one of you, we all, when we hear, for, for in our case, those three little words, you have cancer, he has cancer, she has cancer, your child has cancer, your partner. It changes your life forever. And what you do with it is the real choice you have. And I always say to people, we always said to each other, we can't plan to, we can plan tomorrow, but we need to live today. And so I say to all of you, God bless you, and let's all work together and make a difference. And by the way, we not only are still doing our cancer caregiver education programs, we are also starting our virtual program. And I have a card that explains we're doing a free cancer conference, cancer caregiver conference on October 26th. And you're all welcome and help yourself to the information because you, like some others, you can help save a life. So talk about it. Right, Jack? I'm so bossy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Barbara.